Hey everyone, welcome to week 11, day five on our inside, outside, interior, exterior week. I think we've had a, a whole you know, week full of exciting work. Uh, we did Danny's portrait, then we did our cupboard, a very abstract, tiny little painting. I liked it. Uh, it's been my favorite so far. And then we did uh, Danny's feet, uh, one foot kind of curling onto the other one, which I really, really liked. Uh, and yesterday I painted our balcony, uh, which is very narrow. So it's, it, it kind of feels very claustrophobic. So I thought that it was very interesting to paint because it was the threshold in a way of the inside of our apartment and the outside world, but that how that threshold just feels kind of crowded and very, very small. And I think it was a super cool painting to do. And, uh, you know, today we are going to try to uh, redefine, define uh, those terms and see what we can come up with. So thank you for hanging out this week. Next week, as always, we are your rock. We are here for you. So we'll have an another theme. And uh, I'll see you guys next week. And thank you for hanging out this week with us. So bye. Take care. Okay, Friday. <laughs> Last day of this interior exterior themed week. So let's get started. Now today's painting is going to be a little strange. I don't know if you guys are going to feel it while I'm painting. But I can totally narrate what actually happened. If I'm being completely sincere with you guys. I struggled a ton. I really, really struggled with this one. I actually took it to a point in the end where I was very, very satisfied. But as I was painting it, I lost it. <laughs> and by lost it, I don't mean like <laughs> I started throwing my paintbrushes around and just cursing in the air. Although there was maybe some cursing in my brain. <laughs> I'm with my kids right now. We're quarantined, so I can't curse out loud. But when I'm frustrated, and especially if I'm frustrated painting, oof, it is tough. It is very, very tough. And the reason I think it was tough it's not because I wasn't able to paint what I was trying to paint, but because I think the idea that I had, the intent that I originally had, just escaped me. And there's a point in the painting nearing the end where I'm like, okay, F this. <laughs> I just have to make this work. I have to find another way out. Because it is very strange, but I think this is one of the first paintings that I've done in this project where I reach a point and I say, yeah, it's not really working. What I wanted to do for some reason, it's just not working. So I have to try something else. As painters, it is at that moment that we just become very desperate and we tend to just, you know, <laughs> with a palette knife, just stab the painting and fling it <laughs> across our studio or just scrape the whole thing down and just say, ah, this was a terrible day and I don't want to look at you and I'll come back tomorrow and maybe things will be better. <laughs> I just need some fresh air. I just need to clear my head, but this isn't working. I can't give myself <laughs> that moment in this project because the idea is to fight through those four hours that I'm painting. Uh, and I love that. I actually love the fact that I have to put myself up against the wall and say, yeah, well, things weren't working out. Do something. Do something about it and make it work. But here's the tough part, I think. The part where you reflect about the painting comes after the actual painting of the painting. I think it's very, very tough to do that while you're painting. But this exercise demands that. It's actually telling you, Hey, if you want to have this painting be about something else, you have to be willing to change it as you're painting, to make shifts as you're painting, to recognize that voice that is changing and then see how that change of intent reflects in the manner in which you're painting. So I'll tell you guys what I wanted to do and then I'll tell you guys what it slowly became. Once I introduced an element that's going to come up a little bit later in the uh, in the video. So what I wanted to do is actually spurred by having my son and daughter with me here. And the fact that they have been enclosed in this space and 
there's nothing more unnatural. I mean, we were talking about yesterday, or uh, was it not yesterday, the day before, how, you know, when talking about Uglo, the fact that when you ask a model to stay still in a very weird pose, it's just not natural. I wonder if Uglo ever posed for anyone because posing is one of the most painful things that anyone can ever do. It really is painful to your body. Models usually, not always, but usually are people that understand and recognize what their body can and can't do. So they're very, very aware of their body as a machine and they know when something is in tension and they know when something's gonna, it's gonna hurt eventually, it's gonna be painful. So they're very, very intelligent about their bodies. But even for them, it is painful. So when I imagine a kid having to stay still, that is just insane to me. That is just absolute insanity to me. Because if there's anything that exemplifies the nature of being young is to be restless, <laughs> is to move around, is to have so much energy that you don't know what to do with it. So when you put kids, you know, particularly for me, when you put two kids in this enclosed space, it's just a recipe for disaster. For them, it's just strange to just be cooped up. It's just very, very weird to have them in a place where you can't just tell them, okay, let's go out for a walk and just air them out and just <laughs> just try to tire them with just a long, long walk. But that doesn't happen. So what I did with this one was I actually asked Fair if she could pose with a chair. And I thought that that stripe could symbolize the glass that was in the outside and my positioning in the outside. And then everything else that was inside was going to be subdued. That was the literal word that I thought when I said, oh, I can paint this and I can actually speak about what is going on right now, but it has to be subdued. And there has to be one moment of, of contrast, like my value for that stripe has to be really, really dark and then nothing in the inside can be as dark as that stripe. So I have to really, really control my values and really control my saturation. So I, I, I wanted it to be muted, almost like dead still. That was the whole reasoning behind it. And, and you know, Fed is actually not even sitting properly in this chair. She doesn't have backing. So everything about it is kind of uncomfortable. She's subjected to it. She's forcing herself by pushing with her arms on her thighs and knees, pushing her back to be kind of straight and then putting her little feet together. So there's something that feels very forced about this pose. And I thought that's perfect. It's, it's almost like in a... In a very subtle way, I'm actually telling this kid, stay still. And stay still for a kid sounds like an order. So I thought, yes, this is going to be wonderful. I'm going to have this, this great stripe. And then past this glass, past this stripe, is going to be muted. There's going to be almost like a force that is stripping it from value, stripping it from movement, stripping it from saturation. And I really liked that. I really, really liked that that was the direction that I wanted. And I don't know, for some reason I thought I liked areas of the painting and you probably saw I struggled with understanding what I wanted to do with Fer's construction of the head. And eventually the painting was actually slipping through my fingers in many ways. I just, I just didn't know exactly what I wanted to do with it. In terms of construction, I, I knew what I wanted in terms of tone but I didn't know how to construct it. And I thought, yeah, I'll just control value and it's just gonna happen. And it wasn't happening, it really, really wasn't. And the painting itself started to give me clues as to what I needed to do, and it was drawing. I had to start to introduce very playful drawing marks because that was the one thing that gave the portrait of Fer character because I tried to do it through masses of paint because I wanted it to be simple and it wasn't working. And it's one of those things that I was like, okay, dude, if this is not working, try something else because this is clearly not working for you. And I don't know why it was. I've painted a ton of heads and it's not a matter of me being able to paint it or not. I mean, granted, there's gonna be tons of times where I struggle, but 
I usually know what I can and what I can't do. And I was like, no, I can do this, but it just wasn't coming out the way I wanted until I was like, okay, let me redraw. And once I redrew and I introduced this kind of playful, curvy, linear manner of drawing, I was like, okay, this is something different. This can be a way out. For example, with the fingers, I was trying to block in the hands. I was like, I could probably get away with doing everything in a very uh, kind of structured manner, and then the face can be delineated a little bit more. But it just wasn't looking right. It looked like I was trying to resolve the portrait in one way, and then the rest of the painting was done separately. So as soon as I embraced the fact that I was going to draw, I was like, okay, let's actually do this. Let's draw. Let's introduce a drawing element into this painting. This actually speaks about the nature of the kid, the flowing kind of free nature of being a kid. And this is going to be perfect. And once I said, yes, that's what I'm going to do, poof, everything opened up. I was like, hell yeah, this is what I needed. This is exactly what I needed. It was, it was not the painting I started out to paint, but it was the painting that became. It actually ended up being something that I could grasp. And that's the important part. And this painting formally is not really difficult to paint because I gave myself some room where I really wasn't dealing with a ton of hues or a ton of saturation or a ton of contrast. That made it a little bit easier, but even making it easier, it wasn't easy. That's the thing about painting. You could be painting the simplest of things and it's just not easy. While this painting is very, very consciously repressed, the nature of those drawing marks is actually totally the opposite. And when I do these drawing marks that I do, my mind is transported to, <laughs> to a place which is a little weird, but I think all these three people kind of meet somewhere in my brain, and it's very, very playful. And I think, let me see if we could do it chronologically. It started with my brother having a Pink Floyd poster in his room. It was the Gerald Scarf poster. Gerald Scarf is a British illustrator. He's a cartoonist. He's a political cartoonist. But he did this really strange. I loved it. I was like, this is so weird and deformed. And this is one of the posters that is in my brain forever until the day I die. That line that's very distorted, but curvy, but violent, but weird. I don't know. I, I love that poster. And I remember 1992. I think that movie's 92. And I saw Cool World, which I think it's a universally hated movie. Uh, to be 100% honest, I think I may have watched it again. I don't know. Over 10, 15 years ago. So, you know, I, I watched it at the time and then I watched it some years later and I still thought it looked cool. So I don't know. I have no clue how it has aged. I don't want to look. I really don't. I want to preserve the memory that I have in my brain. But at that time, and for me being 15, I thought it was amazing. I thought it was bizarre. I thought it was quirky and strange and I loved it. I actually loved it. I think that's directed by Ralph Bakshi. And um, some of the animation is just, it's just bonkers. It's just really, really weird. I don't know if, if the movie is great, but I just loved the animated part. So it's actually live action and it has part animation, sort of like Roger Rabbit uh, type of movie. But it's just really bizarre. If you guys have never seen it and... If you are up to watching a movie that maybe hasn't aged that well, you should totally see <laughs> Cool World. It, it's a, a very young uh, Brad Pitt. And so there's these two very weird illustration, animation, again, curvy lines, very bizarre, which meet perfectly with Inka Essenheis, particularly her work, her early work. So I'm talking maybe 20 years ago. And she used to do these enamel paintings, these big enamel paintings. And she has just a gorgeous hand, just her control, her line control. It's just ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. I was actually lucky, and I re really do feel 
that I'm lucky to have seen some of these enamel paintings. And I was blown away. And because they're enamel, it just, the color, the saturation is just gorgeous. It's just absolutely gorgeous. The surface, obviously, it's, it's super glossy, but it just looked, ugh. And her figures are so weird. It's just weird stuff. Now, granted, she's a terrific painter. She's an absolutely terrific painter. And she's doing, you know, very, very different work uh, nowadays. It's far more, like, naturalistic. Um, there's a sense of atmosphere and three-dimensionality. And these other ones were were um, flatter. It, it, was, it was just something totally, totally different. And I actually met her when I went to... Um, the uh, New York Academy of Art, and she, I, I don't know if she's teaching there still, but um, I was so kind of struck. It's one of those moments where you're, where you're kind of starstruck, <laughs> and I was like, I, I'm going to be a fanboy, but I love your work. I probably sounded like an idiot, like, I'm, a, I'm your fan, I'm your biggest fan. I don't know, like like a dork, but um, I wish I could have asked her if if she was influenced by either Cool World or, or you know, that Pink Floyd poster. And it would have been awesome. Like, if she would have connected those things, I would have been like, hell yeah! Like, those things I connected in my brain, they actually connect. But anyways, I'm, I'm bringing these awesome artists up because I do think there's a playfulness to, to having the liberty to draw... Uh, with that line quality, but I think this painting is actually uh, playing off of that. It's actually saying, well, I am constructed by this line. I actually came to be because of these drawing marks, but they are subjected to uh, staying still, and I love that. I really do feel that there's a ton of energy that's like really, really compressed and really, really trying its best to just hold still, and that's what I wanted. <laughs> and that's exactly what I wanted. That's that's the feeling that I wanted. So I actually got to what I wanted in the end, but through a path that I didn't really intend to travel through. <laughs> and that's awesome because painting is that. Painting can be about control and knowing exactly what to do and then saying, I just have to go through A to B to C to D and I'm done. And this was, no, this was a little bit different. If you could have John Malkovich my brain and see what I was going through while I was painting this, it was scrambled eggs <laughs> the whole time. So I was very happy with what I ended up with because it does speak about this unnatural quality of this line. It is symbolizing the energy that my kids have and how that energy is just absolutely contained and it's just unnatural. I really feel that I struggled to say that. I struggled to recognize that, but I got there. I got there in the end, and that's the important part. Again, this week was very cool. It was about coming to terms with a lot of, of what we're going through. So I was very happy to, uh, to give myself the opportunity to deal with those things with painting. It's a perfect excuse, painting, drawing, this is the perfect excuse to try and figure things out quietly. And and that's what we did this week. And I, I am I'm glad to say that while I'm painting, I, I am lucky enough to get to a point where I find clarity. I always tell people, this is an invitation to give yourself the chance, to grant yourself the opportunity to, to be quiet for a couple of hours. And oh, there's nothing like it. There's nothing as peaceful as that. And regardless of what the painting looks like, this painting could have been a disaster. And I still would have told myself, yeah, but going through this battle of trying to understand what I was trying to do to tame this painting as, I, as if it was, it was funny what was happening formally. I mean, me trying to understand how to paint this, it was also like me trying to tame this child and, and telling them, stay still. I, it was almost like my hand was moving too fast. My brain was moving too quickly. And I was trying to tell my brain, slow down, slow down so I can actually understand what's going on. So there's beautiful echoes of everything that's going on within the act of painting. But I always say it, 
if we are willing to listen. If not, then paintings just come and go and we can sit down and, I don't know, we're, we're never going to see uh, the most beneficial aspect of a painting if we don't pay attention. So that was it for this week. I hope you guys are safe. I hope you guys are well. I hope your families are well. And with patience, we'll wait for next week where <laughs> we'll have a new theme. So this is an invitation to you guys to uh, come and share with us this little moment that we have every day uh, next week with a new theme. So thank you guys. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.